<clears throat> and uh, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, and we even have some good evenings to certain individuals who are joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Failing. I'm the uh, new business development director for uh, Lucas Diesel Systems. And on behalf of the company, Lucas Diesel Systems, I'd like to welcome everybody to the second in a series of uh, webinars sponsored by the company. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to cover uh, real quickly. Uh, for your information, we have muted all of you and we've also uh, muted, if one can say, your, your video as well. So you can only see Tony and myself on the screen like that. There's no real distractions. Um, with regards to questions and answers, we're going to keep all our questions and answers to the end. But uh, I may suggest that at the bottom of your screen, and if you move your cursor with your mouse, you can see the bottom of the screen. And right there about the middle of the screen, it says Q&A. So if you click on that, you can uh, enter your questions. And then we'll be taking all those questions at the end of the webinar. And Tony... Uh, uh, we'll be uh, we'll be answering all of those questions or as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So please uh, move your mouse, get down to the bottom there uh, where you see the Q&A. Click on that and then you'll be able to um, place your questions right down there at the bottom. Um, a little bit about our webinar and our presenter. Our presenter this morning is Tony Salas. Tony is an instructor with Power Powertrain Training based in Las Vegas. And Tony has been teaching classes nationwide for approximately 35 years. He is currently a course instructor for powertrain training. He specializes in light and medium duty diesel applications. His instruction focuses not only on product specifics, but use of diagnostic tools, service information, and critical thinking, which is needed to diagnose and repair today's trucks. Um, Tony works, as I said just a little earlier on, on automotive and light duty and medium duty diesel vehicles on a daily basis. So he has a lot of firsthand knowledge and um, practical knowledge on all of these vehicles, which uh, necessitates, you know, which is necessary for um, doing a lot of the, the diagnostic uh, work that he does, as well as teaching all of us here. Uh, his company, Powertrain Training provides hands-on training. They're based in Las Vegas. And he is a training provider which also operates a light and medium duty service facility in, uh, in Las Vegas. Um, as you can see by the title on your slide there, uh, this morning we're going to be uh, talking about power stroke and specifically the 6.7 liter power stroke. And the 6.7 is now 10 years old. It's a little hard to believe that it's already 10 years old. Um, there's been a lot of updates to, the, uh, to this engine and Tony will be covering a lot of issues, diagnostic strategies uh, with regards to common rail, CP4 and after treatment issues. Um, there will be instruction on changes to the fuel system, intake and engine components. And uh, the 2011 model year to 2020. Also, Tony will uh, stress uh, service information and scan tool PID analysis. So it's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Tony Salas. Tony, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're calling from. I actually am not in Las Vegas this week. I'm actually in Walton, Kentucky. I'm actually working with a company here called ATEC, but I'm here to help you out and talk about or discuss with you the Power Stroke 6.7. So without any more introductions, let's get into the nitty gritty because I got a lot of slides to cover here in the next hour and a half. By the way, welcome. So like I said, uh, like David said, actually, when you uh, have any questions, just type it in the Q&A. And after I get done, we'll definitely cover some of those questions and try to answer you or lie to you. No, I'm going to answer you, of course. Um, first of all, as we get into 6.7, yes, like David said, we're quite a lot of years into the 6.7. So since 2011 model year, we saw a lot of changes. But what's currently going on here with Ford, just a quick recap for those of you that may or may not know. 
there is the 6.2 liter gas motor, the 7.3 and the 6.7 liter. As we look at the numbers, I guess that it all comes down to the numbers of where we're at. Let's go to the bottom here. You're going from 385 horsepower to 430 horsepower to 475 horsepower. A lot of power, not to mention the torque. And we're now in the over 1,050 foot pounds of torque. But the one thing I want you to keep in mind is that you got to pay to play. And what I mean by pay to play is that have we seen some issues with the 6.7 due to the fact that they're pushing the numbers even higher in terms of horsepower and torque? And the answer is yes. So believe it or not, I've had some customers that have had uh, diesels for a long time and they're towing a boat or they're mostly a hobby truck, not really a work truck. And I, I come to the point that, you know, they're ready for a new truck. And I tell them, you know what, you're probably better off you know, going with a gas motor, given all the issues that we're having with a diesel application today. So let's not lie about it. There's a lot of things going on with these. So and one of the things I've been talking about in my classes, and some of you may have heard this in previous webinars or classes, but it's something that is sad to say in many ways, but yet it's a fact about our business in the drive-in service. And that is, you know, if I were to purchase a brand new F-350, F-450, fully loaded from Ford. And we're talking about, you know, it's under 100,000 or now it's actually over $100,000 for a truck, you know? So what are the odds that the truck will be in for warranty issues within a year? I mean, what's the reliability of this engine? I have fleets in the Las Vegas area, like I have at this tow company I'm working with. And in this case, you know, they already have gone through a few engines already. As a matter of fact, you know, a few months ago, we were actually, there was no engines available. They were all on national backward. I don't know where it is right now, but we literally had to rebuild the engines or he actually for his other trucks had to buy a used wreck truck and take the engine out of it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is why is it that we're actually having such a short life on some of these engines, especially on the commercial use? You know, my customer could be a, you know, independent uh, guy who just has his truck that uses it to pull whatever he's pulling. And then I got the commercial accounts where it's a tow service, a fleet service, a plumbing service, you know, whatever. So therefore, we need to, you know, educate our customers. So that's one thing we need to hit hard and heavy is that are you educating your customers about what we're doing? In other words, what's going on with trucks, the oil change issues, the maintenance issues, the CP4 issues and all these things that are going on, not to mention the after treatment along with the use of death fluid. We have to educate our customers to make them understand because they cannot just be filling a truck and take off with it, you know, so we'll get more into that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is what has gone with the reliability. So if I go buy that new truck, how many miles or kilometers should I be getting out of this truck? You know, so, so there's going to be a key things that we're going to review. So what are we going to talk about? Well, uh, obviously, we're going to introduce the Power Stroke 6.7. For those of you that haven't had any 6.7 training, uh, the reverse flow engine there, you can see in the picture, yes, the engine is reverse flow. For those of you who never thought about or seen this, because some of you might be novices, some of you be advanced technicians. So in this case, we see that the exhaust is exiting to the valley of the engine, of the V-type V8 engine, and we see the turbocharger there. So... Uh, second thing is codes. We're going to talk about DTCs quickly, about Keon engine off, Keon engine running, the strategies that Ford has had for a long time. So be if you've been working with 6.0s, 6.4s, you know what I'm talking about. Not to mention what's going on with scan tool. You know, we like to use the IDS scan tool, which is a Ford proprietary scan tool, along with and we're dealing with a lot of networks issues. So that's something that's going on as well. We also have the engine and the cooling systems. Believe it or not, my neighboring shop where I'm at actually came and asked me, you know, we're not, we don't know what's going on. We're pressure testing and we see another degas bottom. And they didn't realize there's two cooling systems on that truck. I'm like, guys, you need to get some six, seven training, you know. Not to mention the EGR updates that have occurred since 2015 model year. We'll talk about that and hit you on the latest that we're coming across with the common rail piezo common rail injection. So it is a Ford engine, okay? As you know, the 6.4 and 6.0s and the 7.3s were all made by International Navistar. And in this case, the 2015 had changes. So if we start off in 2011 and we moved over to 2015, we do have or have had changes with the engine itself. But the common rail Bosch still is being used with the CP4 injection pump. So as you look at more of those of you that like to surf or play on YouTube, you're going to see that a lot of shops are admitting to the fact that they're not seeing as much CP4 failure as seen before. Well, a lot has to be how you service it. So we'll talk about the CP4, but let's get something clear. Do you understand common rail? 
You know, you cannot diagnose a high pressure problem unless you confirm low pressure. I've said that over and over for the longest time. So in this case, we're going to talk about that and then the return. And then after treatment, obviously, we're going to be here for an hour and a half. And are you going to learn everything and anything? You're going to learn a little bit, I hope. I want to give you something that you'll take to the shop tomorrow. But have you had training on after treatment? Because that is a whole thing that we need to deal with. And the reality is this. Does it cost a lot of money? Yes. And, you know, this past July, I did an East Coast swing in the United States where I visited several shops and did a lot of training for over three to four weeks. I was on the road. And in this case, you know, it was interesting how many trucks are deleted. You know, certain parts of the countries, the guys are still doing deletes. It's a, it's not monitors, but, you know, slowly but surely the EPA keeps getting and nailing shops and finding shops. But I know that the independent customer is also deleting. But the problem, and let me stop here for a minute. The problem with deletes is this. You do whatever you want with your truck. I don't care. But the thing is, when we're diagnosing certain issues on the trucks, many delete programs won't let me run tests like uh, the power balance test. Or actually, it shuts down. They literally turn off some needed diagnostic trouble because that would make my life easy to diagnose. So if the truck comes in for stalling or hesitation or lack of power, you know, it, the problem is that I don't have a code set for it. So then I got to start going from every part of that engine to, to see which subsystem is causing the problem. So yes, some tuners are turning off diagnostic trouble code. So I guess what I tell customers, if you're going to delete it, that's your business, whatever, but make sure that there's an ability for me to turn it back to stock, at least for testing purposes. You may want to say the same. So anyways, with that said, get some information on after treatment, know what it's doing. So, and do you have scan tool service information? You know, it is very important that you have you know, the scan tool, the proper scan tool and service information. If you're using Google to find everything you need, you're wrong. You need to have service information because I've been running into a few shops that don't have their pro demand, their all data, their identifix or any related service information from the manufacturer. So, so what are you using, you know? And if you're not acclimated with your all data pro demand or identifix, you should. And in this case, don't be wasting time. So you should on your own time, contact these, these providers and get up to date on your service information and where to find stuff. And we're also talking about the issues that we need to address and also how to lengthen the life of your Power Stroke 67 or for the customer. So there have been updates, like we just saw we, the 2020 update that came about, even though the 23 models are already rolling up. God, it's already been three years since this slide came out. But in this case, there have been numerous updates going on here, along with the, you know, the engine and the SCR and the BPF. You're going to see some differences with it. So the block itself is pretty stout. Um, but again, it relies heavily on the engine oil. So I guess I'll throw it right, right now. What is one of the key items that we need to be paying attention to a power stroke 67 is the fact that it actually needs to have more frequent oil changes for the simple fact that that engine has got some heavy congestion and heavy constipation for the simple fact that we got carbon accumulation on the intakes and we got suit accumulation and other issues in the after treatment and the exhaust, and that creates a problem. So as we start about talking about what I have to deal with or what I'm working with when I work on a power stroke six, seven is understanding the code. And those of you that have been in my classes, you probably heard this again. What is a diagnostic trouble code? And the joke I always make when I diagnose a truck is that, you know, I look at the truck, I see the check engine light. And yes, I am going to do my strategy of diagnosing. And I'm going to look underneath the hood, test batteries, check for leaks, see what's going on underneath the engine. And then finally, when I get to the point that I'm going to scan it, you know, I'm going to look at, okay, what is going on with this codes? But Ford gives you something special. There is key on engine off self-test, key on engine running self-test. There's a series of them that you should perform. But it also has continuous memory codes and also on-demand codes. So let's briefly talk about that here in a second. But what do you have to understand that there's a portion in the computer that's always testing, testing, testing. For example, I was talking to a counterpart here, awesome instructor here, and he was telling me how they were figuring out a problem on another vehicle and it had a circuit high code, circuit open code. It's like, really? And they couldn't figure out the problem. The code is telling you that there's a circuit open. And your job is to follow the diagnostic chart to know where that circuit open is. Hello, you got to know this. So if you're thinking that the code is going to do everything for you, you're wrong. But it's going to lead you in the direction where you need to look at. 
So I'll get more into that later. But in this case, what I'm trying to say is the computer's constantly testing, 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 and you can tell the computer to actually test for you. So here you can see an IDS screen right now, and you have to understand that on-demand codes is the product of me running a self-test. So what do you do? You do a key on engine off self-test just like you've done in all previous power strokes. Click, 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 click. We see things turning on and on, and he's actively testing those powertrain circuits. Hear me correctly, powertrain circuits. And then what you can do is you can do a series of, of uh, key on engine running tests too as well. So you can have those hard codes that the computer sets for himself, and those are continuous memory codes. While the product of doing a self-test will give you an on-demand code, meaning I demanded the key on engine, off, key on engine running self-test to perform this. So if you ever look at videos on YouTube of these professional Ford master technicians, you're going to find out many of them are trained by Ford that they're not supposed to just retrieve continuous memory codes. They will always run self-test. That's why I like that button way down here on the lower right, which lets you repeat a self-test. So if you're dealing with an intermittent problem and you want to run a self-test, I will move that laptop over into the engine compartment and I will run a self-test and I'm going to be wiggling wires while I'm performing the self-test because if there's an intermittent open, I could probably try the computer to test that circuit and I might catch it. Another quick tip. So I guess what I'm trying to say is those of you guys that are doing testing, it's a good idea to go ahead and run a self-test, but at the same time, run it over and over again. And while it's running, start wiggling wires and stuff underneath that engine compartment to try to nail maybe which circuit there is. But then again, when we look at codes, here you can see a P00BC, which is your mass airflow circuit A performance. Now, you gotta, guys got to learn how to read the titles of these codes because they tell you a whole heck of a lot. He's telling you that the performance is not there and because the airflow is too low. I would say that the mass airflow is the number one replace sensor that probably 90% of them were not bad at all because it's reading the actual airflow. So can something as frivolous as your air filter restricted cause that airflow code? And, you know, in this case, if I follow, you know, and that's why we ask you, because if you guys are... Those of you that are good techs, well, you probably know what to do. But those of you guys that are lousy techs, maybe you ought to get into the habit of reading. And what can I read here? I see the EGR system leak, damaged EGR, intake air system leak between the air filter and the turbo, intake air system restriction between the air filter and the turbocharger. Yes, we have had numerous trucks that have come in where the air filter was just clogged up, you know. So, and obviously, we can have some issues with the sensor itself. But what I guess what I'm trying to entertain here with you is the fact that you've got to do a little reading, especially those of you are starting out or have bad habits and you haven't been succeeding. So at that point, you have diagnostic aids, you know, and you also can review. So I can continue on with the actual process. Now, I guess what I tell technicians over and over again is, have you ever tried to diagnose and follow it by the book? And what are you going to learn along the way? And yeah, you're going to learn. Our, for example, here it says there, uh, we're going to go ahead and check the connector disconnect and measure the voltage. So we're going to measure some voltage there. We're going to look at the wiring diagram here in a second. But then it says access to PCM and monitor the MathLearn <coughs> and the MathLearn idle PIDs. Record the PID values. Is the voltage greater than 10.5? Hey, okay, I'm going to verify that. Then it's telling me to do an intermittent check and tells me these steps of what I can do by accessing, again, what am I controlling here? The EGR and the turbocharger itself, and I'm going to follow these steps. In the end, it says, um, does the mass airflow frequency, which is HC, exceed the set limits range? I guess what I'm trying to say, it's telling you what to do, and what you're literally doing is you're playing with the back pressures of the turbo that's that it's created, and two, you're actually open and closing the EGR throttle plate and the EGR itself. So therefore, there's many different things you're playing with. Obviously, I'm not going to go into details in it, but it does tell you what you're looking for in terms of testing to see what the flow is across the mass airflow. In other words, if the mass airflow sensor is reading low, it's because maybe there's low airflow, period. There's nothing wrong with the airflow, a mass airflow sensor. There's a problem with the airflow. And what are these causes that are causing this airflow? For example, can a restricted after treatment system or a diesel particulate filter cause back pressure come up, which affects airflow. Yeah, you know. So in this case, again, you're going to follow these steps to read what's going on here. So I guess what I'm trying to challenge you with, those of you that have those bad habits, and you know who you are, you need to start following service information steps that tell you what you want to do. 
And when I see successful technicians, those are the ones that I can see, hey, Tony, I read step two, I did step J8 and this and that. Now what do I do? You know, Because I get off in phone calls where people want the quick answer, quick fix, and it's like, no. And one of the things you're going to see here also that's out that you're going to see is the fact, oops, is that you're going to see that, sorry, skip the slide, is that smoke testing. So therefore, you need to find now what's going on with the intake. And I've been talking about smoke testing for quite a while, but here you can see where Ford is actually telling you to pressurize the intake system to as much as 20 PSI. And those of you that haven't purchased a high-pressure smoke machine, let me tell you, once you get it, you fall in love with it because you're going to find out at least half the trucks you diagnose are going to have major intake leaks, you know, and you're losing boost and it's affecting your mass air readings too as well, which can also cause injector quantity and injector uh, timing codes to be set. So very important to learn off of these. So in this case, another step here to check the mass airflow operation is telling you where the frequency should be at idle, both for not only the super duty trucks, but also even the transit vans, if you're starting to deal with those two, but that's another class in itself there. So, so as I look at a mass airflow wiring, you know, I'm a wiring diagram kind of guy, and I always like to look at, okay, what's going on here? You know, one of the things we've been discussing this week, and I will talk about later, is also about voltage drop testing, you know, and we see here that we need to have some kind of voltage being applied here. So in this case, I see hot and start to run. So terminal three right here is telling me that I'm supposed to have, you know, battery voltage. And many guys that have replaced mass airflow sensors where the problem was not in the mass airflow, it was in the fact that maybe it had a high voltage drop across terminal three or at terminal three, better yet. So therefore, this is a heated wire film. So begs the question, do you know how a mass airflow sensor works? So in this case, you know, when we see codes that are set by the computer, you know, maybe you have cleaned the intakes, maybe you have addressed the EGR, you've seen, and you still got mass airflow codes. Well, it could be maybe an electrical problem going on with it. So it, you need to verify the signals, the grounds, and especially doing a voltage drop test with power. So something you got to pay attention to. So as we skip gears here, a very popular problem we see with a lot of power stroke 67s, F250, F350, 450, is the wiring going to an alternate. How many trucks have I seen come in with the actual battery light on? And in this case, many times we don't understand what's going on here. Here you could see one truck right here. It's like, okay, here's my starter motor. Here's my battery. But you're going to notice that Ford likes to still use fusible links. But you see a mega fuse here on the top but we also have fusible links going away from the battery. So here we see one battery, but let's take it a little step further on this 2012 model. Yes, I, I can't put the whole diagram here, but what I am trying to show here is that let's take a look at the charging system. So when people, when I see charging lights on, it kind of frustrates me because that yellow wire is a big one that I have fixed it through time. And that wire literally goes from the passenger side to the driver's side where the alternator generator is located at. And in this case, you know, you got to follow that wiring through that tray that goes to the front of the open around, and you could have an open on that yellow wire. So yeah, we need to do a continuity check between, you know, pin 53 here, all the way to pin two over here on this yellow wire that we see here on the bottom. So I'll zoom it up. And it's kind of a sin that you don't verify those wires are actually connected. So yeah, it's important. So you can, in the service manual, let's say you have access to this wiring diagram, there is a connector in view that makes it easy for you to see where pin 53 and pin 14 is on connector 1232B. So you need to locate that. So if you're not very good with this stuff, you need to get good at this stuff. And what I mean by that is getting patience to find that. So, And I have told many techs that have attended my classes, hey, call me. I don't have a problem with you calling me and I will walk you through where all this stuff is because if you need help, you know, a lot of you know that I have an open channel. Yes, I'm busy sometimes and yes, it's hard for me to get, but I eventually will make time for you and you can help me and help me all you want. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is, A, I need to have battery power. I could see battery power here coming through that fusible link going down here to AS, which is pin three. And then we have our control wires for communication between the alternator itself and also the computer, because the computer has to tell them when to start charging to them what to do with the regulator. So your job is to verify, or do you have continuity between those? So at that point, if she's still not charging, so the question begs is, do we have a problem in the regulator generator needs to be replaced? Or maybe there's a PCM problem, which is highly doubtful. Most of it's in the wiring or in the generator itself, and also making sure that we have a good ground 
going to the generator as well. So that's where voltage drop testing would come in, where I'm going to make a voltage drop test between ground or the case of the, of the generator over to the negative side of the battery, see if I have any voltage drop there. And then while it's charging, I can also check the integrity of the cable of the charging output back or back terminal, as we like to call it, between positive of the battery post to positive of that general while the engine's running. We should not see a huge voltage drop at all. Less than two tenths is what we want to see. But again, that's something that we have to learn with electrical. And as I see this application too, a little bit different, the wires are different on the 2017 F250. You're going to notice instead of using a fusible link, they went to a what? A mega fuse. So in this case, you can see a 275 amp mega fuse, which is now located on many models on the studs of the battery junction block. So that's another thing that you're going to look at here. So did they change between these model years, as you can see on these diagrams? Yes. So do I take time or should you also take time to verify what has gone on with these circuits? Yes. Now, if you're looking for information, there are charts here. Like for, I just talked about the alternator generator. Look at all these codes you have available to you that you can go to these perspective pinpoint tests to aid you in diagnosing. So if you cannot turn off that battery light off, shame on you. Because guess what? In the service manual, you have all these codes, and these are the pinpoint test charts that are there for you. So, hello, you got it. It's there. But then again, it gets even further. If for those of you that are weak in this area, is understanding what's going on with networks, you know. And what I say by networks, we've been talking about this, and guys still don't know. For example, pin 16 is battery power, four and five are your grounds. CAN communication is taking place between six and 14. And then we got medium speed two, and also we have the low speed CAN. And I've been showing this diagram. This is an early 2012 model. You can see here of the data link connector. And you know, you're gonna have issues where you're gonna have no communication or you're gonna have portion of the network. So the big thing I see a lot of different uh, training companies, my competitors, are selling you on, and that's okay, is to, you know, how to diagnose when you've got network issues, you know. You know, and you, for those of you who've never seen this, it's like here's pin six and 14 of your can, of your high speed can, then there's your medium speed can on three and 11. And you can see how it immediately splits up, but we're gonna follow just A and B right here. So we're gonna continue with the circuit on A and B, and you're gonna see that this goes to an array of different modules right here. And then it goes over to J and K, and as I follow J and K, we're going to see, again, eventually go to the diesel PCM right there. But hold on a second. On the other side, we have another perspective CAN network within the PCM that goes to the glow plug control module. And if I continue to the next slide, it goes to the NOx sensor modules. So have we seen issues on the networks in many different parts of the network that can actually shut down? I mean, look at all these two wire setups right here ground it at one perspective circuit. Let's say there's a short to ground corrosion or something. You know, what's going to happen there? And what's going to happen is that it can actually literally intermittently shut down the network. You know, I've been showing this video for quite some time now. I don't know how well it's coming on your end, but it's you're going to see that, uh, look at the temperatures on the top and you're going to see the multiple messages. Some of you may have seen this. There are many issues that can cause this default action that a early model 6.7 power stroke for product can do. Again, replaying it one more time. Again, this truck only had 29,000 miles. This was actually my first 6.7 that I dealt with years ago. And what I'm trying to show you is that we had a problem. So this is a crank no start problem. And um, obviously I could tell you the whole story, but time is a little bit of essence here. But what we found out is, you know, it was no communication there. So one thing I've been talking about, and a lot of guys have been giving me good feedback about this, is that you're going to see there's the transmission connector, there's your engine connector, and then there's your body connector. Well, in the event that it's not communicating on a 6.7, it gives you that erroneous message, you can actually disconnect this middle big chunk guy, and that's the engine connector. Well, guess what? When I disconnected this engine connector, that computer came to life and was communicating. Sure, it had a lot of code set because that engine connector is off, but we isolated that, hey, the computer's not bad. It's now communicating through the actual body connector. So here's a clue. If you ever worked on six liters and 6.7 liters, please note the body connector has all the body, and not, excuse me, it has all the communication and also the power and grounds that power up this computer.
So you can literally unplug this engine connector and this transmission connector, and the computer should be able to be programmed and should also communicate. Now, why am I doing this? Because the computer did not communicate or you got a crank no start issue. So food for thought there. Again, engine connector, remove it. In the event you have a communication problem, that's a good head start. Now, could there be other issues in the rest of the network like I just showed you in that wiring diagram? And the answer is yes. So with that said, you know, we understand that CAN toggles between zero and five volts. And in this case, you can take your meter, you know, you're like, you, you connect your scan to, hey, it won't communicate. Okay. Let me quickly go to six and 14. So I'm going to go to 14 and ground, as you can see here on the image. And I'm going to check to see if I have that average voltage. And how much of that average voltage be? As you can see on the meter, it should be two and a half volts. So in this case, that's what you're looking for is two and a half volts. Then you go to six, see if you have two and a half volts. So if you don't have two and a half volts, you know, that means you have something grounding or something wrong with the circuit. So it starts with you looking at the wiring diagram. Let's start off here. And then we're going to start moving around to see where I'm dropping, you know, that signal. Where's it dropping the CAN network? So again, quick note, six and 14, two and a half volts, which you should be measuring. Okay, moving along. Initially, the 2011 power stroke 6.7, you know, had, and they still do have the cab chassis, and they also have the uh, the Super Duty pickups. Now, the Super Duty pickups are better known as the wide frame, while the cab chassis are known as the narrow frame. So you're going to notice that the horsepowers initially were 300 on the cab chassis and 390 on the pickup Super Duty pickups. So please note there is a variance between those. So if you look at your service information, you're going to see that one's calling for narrow chassis, which is the cab chassis trucks. And then you got the wide frame, and that is the Super Duty pickups that you see there. Now, if you've been working with these engines, what's been the number one complaint? A lot, well, a lot of complaints, but oil leaks, right? Oil leaks, those of you who have done these, are no fun to do, especially that upper oil pan we see there on the bottom. We see a lower oil pan, but... In this case, it is no fun. If you take the cab off, you know, you got to still remove the transmission. Not a fun job to do major hours to do a oil. But always remember something that if you have repeated failure, even though you went buck wild with that, that you know, that silicone seal, whatever you're using to seal it, it is in my hopes that you understand that we don't have excessive crankcase pressure, which is blow by. So always keep that in mind because what is the number one problem that I'm also number one, but number of top 10 problems that I'm dealing with with the six sevens is excessive blow by. And that's going to cause excessive uh, suit accumulation in the DPF, not to mention ash accumulation in the diesel particulate filter. Now, some of you may already have done the primary water pump or coolant pump, and there's a secondary. I haven't done the secondary yet. If you've done any, let me know, but most of them have been failures with the primary water pump. My caution to you is that if you are replacing that, that primary coolant pump is to make sure you're careful with the wiring that goes right around here. So be gentle with the wiring. And if you have that front oil leak from the vacuum pump, you probably have been doing the whole vacuum pump or the whole covered gasket. So that sits behind her. So those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the vacuum pump sits right in front of the front cover where the injection pump end goes in or the gear is. So therefore, you can take this cover off or this drive. And at that point, you're going to see that the vacuum pump is notorious for leaking oil too as well. So other places to keep in mind, but those are the principal ones. But let's not forget that the Ford has numbered those cylinders in the old school way, which was one, two, three, or four on the passenger side, and five, six, seven, and eight on the driver's side you're going to see as well. This is important to keep in mind when you're programming IQA codes or you're isolating a miss or an issue in a prospective cylinder. Know which number is which cylinder. But the subsystems we got are the Bosch piezo common rail injection, the enhanced turbo with or without wastegate. Yes, we got rid of the wastegate. And then we have the reverse flow intake, enhanced closed crankcase ventilation. There are two separate cooling system, a dual stage EGR cooler, the after treatment, and your headache, the NOx reducing catalyst with NOx sensors and a coolant cool charger cooler we're going to talk about here in a second, and the redesigned you know, engine itself. So we have here the engine block. And for those of you that don't know, the engine block is actually using a six bolt main. You got four on the top and two on the sides. Be aware that those two bolts on the side, you need to make sure that they're not seeping oil. We learned this off the Duramax 6.6, believe it or not. 
once in a while the canoes and the secret to fixing is simply remove the bolt and put some seal around it and put it back in that's the fix i wish you could say hey put an o-ring or gasket oh you put a little sealer around there put it back on to actually help that you know leakage that you can have there so the oil cooler well the oil cooler has a bit of an issue if you guys have seen oil coolers let me know but in this case um you're going to find out that they've changed the design through the years where the bolts are now all external on this early model actually they were two on the inside two on the outside if i remember correctly i could be wrong but in other words there were some bolts on the inside and some bolts on the outside inside and outside so obviously it removed the well it wasn't too hard to take that lower oil pan off so that was kind of nice as well but you know what i don't know what's wrong with some of you guys this was, a, in my opinion, was a great idea. It was a quarter turn. So if you still come across some that still have it, this is a quarter turn drain valve. I just did an oil change before I flew out. I had to do some quick services and maintenance on some of my customers' truck. It ain't fun changing an oil on a truck that you just did a regeneration on. The oil's hot and I got to get the truck out of here. I got to go. And, you know, it's nice to stick a 3H drive extension in here, give it a quarter of a turn, and boom, you're training the oil. Then a quarter of a turn, you put it back on. So sadly ford has eliminated this so therefore if you need to buy another pen because some doofus mcgroof has actually you know stripped this you got to put the stamp steel style pen with the traditional oil plug so those of you that have done that it's ruined 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 those plastic plugs i don't like you because you're making my life hard anyways if you've been watching what's going on with engine oil you know, you, you know that CK4 is the latest oil. So this is an early model picture that I took. You're going to see 10W30 is the recommended oil. And that's what Ford does recommend. And also the 5W40 for severe use. So if you look at the service manual, yes, you can still use 15W40. But those of you guys that live in that stuff that you get snow, it gets cold, it's okay to go to 5W40, not to mention you can even use 030, 040. But please note, you know, CK4 was not liked by Ford. So if you haven't seen the video on YouTube, go ahead and look at it on YouTube. Ford does have a channel where they talk about this issue. So therefore, please note that when you're looking for a good quality oil, it has to have the Ford designation of WSS M2C 171-F1. That is what Ford's calling for. Because if you go, you're going to see a link right here on the bottom. And there is a website that Ford has that actually has the recommended oils that are meeting the Ford requirement, not just the SAE or API requirement. It meets also Ford's requirements. So Ford has done testing. So here's the deal. People often ask, what's the best oil to buy? And they'll ask me, hey, Tony, you got a diesel. What do you use? And I tell them whatever's on sale. As long as it's CK4, along with the 171F1 certification. You know what's funny? And I'm not trying to advertise for them, but I call my local AutoZone here and the AutoZone actually had, oh, we got STPO. I'm like, well, send it down. I looked at the bottle and guess what? It had the CK4 and it also had the Ford and the Cummins and, and other diesel manufacturer certification. So was that oil good enough? Not only did it meet the minimum standards for CK4, but also for the 170 of one. And that's what you need to look in the bottle. Obviously, if you have a preference for an oil, that's what you like. Just make sure it meets the Ford recommended oil guidelines. And always remember something. Think, never associate synthetic oil with extended life. You can't do that. No. Synthetic oil, multigrade oil, fine, whatever you want to use. But understand that they're both at the mercy of whatever's in that crank case. So therefore, if you know diesels, especially with today's diesels that are running over 30 PSI of boost, you're really pushing those engines. And with the congestion and constipation that I mentioned earlier, that oil's taking a big punishment. So should you be doing 10,000 mile oil change intervals? The answer is no, no. at least no more than 5,000 guys, you know? So keep that in mind, all right? Speaking of oil, the six sevens are also coming in with the oil light on. And let me tell you, if the customer drove it in and they've been driving with the oil, oil light on, if it really had low oil pressure, guess what? That motor would have been destroyed. Just note one thing, that it's the oil pressure switch, just like we saw in previous power stroke applications, but there's also an oil temperature switch. And these two boogers are notorious for leaking or seeping oil, causing oil leaks. So if you're doing the oil pressure switch, guess what? Do the oil temperature as well, you know? And as we look at the engine, please note something. 
If you're trying to cover your butt, and what I'm about to say, some of you might not agree with. I, I respect that, but uh, desperate measures, desperate times kind of thing. We traditionally have seen seals right there that, you know, my professor said, if you got a rubber seal and that's all in channeled in there and you put it up against the engine block, you torque it to specifications. Well, guess what? I have done that and I get leaks. So now I'm at the point where I'm using a sealer and I'll tell you what I use. I'm not going to lie to you about it. I actually use the right stuff. That's my favorite. And I actually put a little thin bead around that rubber. You're like, Tony, you're not supposed to do that. Well, guess what? I have wound up with oil leaks and I cannot spare the labor for me to tear this apart because of an oil leak. So if you want to do the same thing, same thing, but I'm just telling you what this guy does here. You know, that's what he does. Yes, I'm guilty of doing that because of those reasons of oil leaks. So with that said, let's move on. Yes, I got a lot to cover here. The cooling systems, as you know or may not know, there are two cooling systems, two complete cooling systems and a 4, 6.7. You got total of four thermostats, 194, 201. So they're staggered differently. And then on the secondary system, you got a 140 and you got a 113, but they're on opposing sides of the radiator. We'll show you here in a second. Let's move on. There you can see your traditional two thermostats on the primary side, which again, will go to how much temperature? 201, you know, 194, 201. And in this case, you're going to see now they're still using the quick couple connections. Some of you like them, some of you don't like them. But the only thing I thank God for Ford is that I can't tell you how many times these little clips have flown off and I'm trying to find the bastard. I don't know where it went. Well, you can now buy them from Ford, these clips now. So that makes life a little easier, you know. But as I look underneath the truck, you're going to see that there is your two radiators. So please note cleanliness and making sure you got adequate airflow because you know I live in Las Vegas and we get that that heavy heat so therefore it gets really hot so we can see problems because of inadequate airflow so airflow is very critical here now in this case you're going to see the radiator on the primary system we have our degas bottle and we have our front cover there but you could see the you can't see very well but there's the the actual primary water pump we must have but again, this is your primary system that's cooling your EGR coolers and your oil coolers as well. So therefore, we see that there. There's our traditional thermostats. But then we got a secondary right there. So we see the secondary system. And the one thing that I'm concerned about has always been that charge air cooler is liquid cooled. So this is a liquid cooled charge air cooler, guys. So if you're not good about maintaining the coolant, that's why these products actually give you a check coolant light. And in this case, that check coolant light is telling you to check the coolant, but not just to see if the level's okay. Hello, no, we'll cover that here in a sec. But note that this secondary system actually not only cools the transmission oil cooler, but also your EGR cooler, but this stopped in 2015. They got rid of secondary coolant in 2015, but you also have the fuel cooler. Quick trivia question. Why do we use full fuel coolers? I'm waiting for answers. Really? It's a fuel condenser. In reality, a fuel cooler is a condenser. It ensures that the fuel does not go into a gaseous state. It stays in a liquid state. That's why many common rails use it. So there you go. Don't say I didn't teach you anything. All righty, there you go. By the way, look at these hoses. Do you see any straight hoses here? Talk about making money off of hoses. You know, because here in, La in Las Vegas, where I live, you know, you actually have something called dry rot. And dry rot, you know, eventually is going to require hose changeouts here. So that's a problem that you're going to see. There's that charge air cooler I was talking about. Again, you may want to spec these. I've already replaced two of them already on a 2013 and a 2012 model. So in this case, you want to make sure there's no evidence of coolant inside that charge air cooler. So be aware of that. Now, when you look at the engine compartment here, it's kind of a sin the way this was designed. Fans are supposed to pull air in, you know, pull air in. And in this case, follow the airflow here. Where is this air going to go? So you can fairly say that there's some horsepower loss because of the airflow coming in. So more than ever, why you need to make sure there's no blockages or dirt that's forming between the radiators and the condenser and everything that's out front here. So bear that in mind as these trucks are aging, you know, they're getting old. So, but here you can see your degas bottle here and way over here, you can see the other degas bottle on the cooling system. So those of you that haven't looked at an engine compartment, this is what you're looking at. And here you can see the boosted air coming out of the turbo going into the charge air cooler. And then you can see it going intake. Well, guess what? This guy, you need to take this tube off, especially when you got EGR flow codes or issues, you better check inside here for massive carbon accumulation on these trucks. So definitely wanna check inside these tubes for, again, 
accumulation of carbon. So as I move along here, yes, I'm moving along fast. I'm sorry, but I'm trying to give you guys a lot of info here. Take a look at the coolant. Um, it says right here, as I move this over, um, initial change, and we're looking here, coolant check change. It says our initial at 60,000 miles or 96,000 kilometers or 2,400 engine hours for those trucks that sit a lot and running at high RPM with PTOs or so hooked up. Subsequently, every 45,000 miles, and I know you guys aren't doing this, 45,000 miles or 1,800 miles. And then it says here, you should do the coolant nitrate strength check every six months, no, nope. every 15,000 miles or 600 engine hours, you're supposed to be doing that, which is what that light comes on or message you get in the dash. So as it's shown down here, again, they're telling you to do a coolant flush. So they're telling you again to use the correct um, additive, which is the Motocraft VC9. So there you go. And obviously you wanna keep an eye for hard water. Us in Las Vegas, we have very heavy water. So we actually use distilled water with the coolant mix or we'll or we'll buy the 50 50 mix depending what coolant i use so what you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to actually be using the test strip here it is from accustrip it is the 328 acuel c40 c48 test kit so step one it's telling you step two step three on how you're supposed to be testing the coolant so if you don't have this it's in the forward service information to test the coolant hello so there's your transmission cooler it's mounted on the side of the chassis frame, and there's your small fuel cooler. I am told that the fuel cooler has isn't missing on some applications. Personally, I haven't seen it, but if you have, let me know because again, that has come out for uh, you know, you know, for what's going on there. So yeah, watch out for that. So yeah, fuel coolers, yes. So with that said, let me keep moving right along. The EGR. All right, so if you've got EGR and this truck idles a lot or does a lot of idle time, that's the worst thing for it because we're going to see carbon accumulation. But please note, there was a difference between the 2011, the 2014s, and then 2015s and on. They're, you're not going to see the carbon accumulation as much on the later models, but they did that update going all the way back to 2011. So I'll talk about that in a second. Note that the early models use secondary cooling and also primary cooling. It used the both cooling systems. While in 2015, they plugged it off and they went to only primary cooling, probably because of the massive carbon accumulation. So as you look at the EGR assembly on top of the valve cover, this is known as a hot EGR. Hot exhaust gases come in first towards the EGR. I mean, think about this. If I look at a 6.0 or 6.4, you're gonna see that the gases come into the EGR after the cooler, then into the intake. Here's reversed. That's why we call it a hot EGR. The gases first come in through the EGR, then onto the coolers. But you got to bypass as well. So if it's too cold, it bypasses the coolers and sends it out to the outlet towards the intake. So here you can see a cross-section of view of the two coolers. So the question begs, can I actually remove them? And the, actual, and the answer is yes, for those of you who have not done it. Yes, you can remove that whole cooler assembly. And what are you going to find? Suit accumulation causing you flow codes with the EGR and other issues too as well. But that is readily available for you to do. But the updated one, it looks a lot like a bulletproof EGR and actually bulletproof cells there too, where you're going to see more of a tubular design. And this is the updated design versus the old design. And here you could see the massive suit accumulation you can get on these applications, which begs the question here. Please note that for 6.7s do run active regenerations, but that actually does post injections on the driver's side cylinders, not on the passenger side, because who's what's on top of the passenger side cylinders? The EGR. So only post-injections are done on the driver's side, and that's what we're looking at there. But if you're cleaning EGR coolers, this stuff from Hydrozone works great. You literally are just dipping it into the uh, the bucket. It comes as a concentrate. You can buy it in one gallon. And no, they're not giving me money for me to tell you this, but this stuff works great. I could leave an EGR cooler sunk in this stuff. It's aqueous. And it actually cleans these EGRs very, very well. There's their phone number if you want to make a note of it. But in this case, they are awesome for cleaning EGR coolers. It's about the only stuff I've seen that works that good. If you got other stuff that works for you, that's great. But this stuff, I, don't, I literally just dip it overnight. Next morning, it's all dissolved and it works very, very well. So if you've done EGR cleaners in the past or intake cleans, you know what I'm talking about. 
the EGR operation. Um, well, again, the EGR operation, like I told you already, uses a bypass as well. This is vacuum control. That's where that vacuum pump is used. So on early models, the vacuum pump is actually activating the wastegate and this diaphragm right here to control the bypass, right? So on the later model years that do not have the wastegate, guess what? They actually are only using vacuum for this actuator for the bypass itself, which has not been a big problem child, I must admit. So there you can see on the 15 update where they're plugging off the prime, uh, excuse me, the secondary cooling. And they also did enhancements to the engine coolant temperature sensor that has been removed from the EGR cooler and thus the hole is plugged there. And to be honest with you, we haven't seen too many problems with the EGR valves. I mean, the EGR valve itself is, is but it's mostly been flow codes and carbon issues that we see accumulated there as well. So watch out for that. So like I said already, to recap, that EGR is before the cooler. So it's a hot EGR. Always remember that. So there you go. Now, as we look at it on the engine, here's my engine on the stand that I have in my training classes. Here you can see the pipe coming over from the exhaust manifold. We said that the exhaust is in the middle. There it goes towards the EGR. It exits the EGR to this tube where it goes into the intake. So obviously you're looking for carbon accumulation here and you're looking at it through here. So therefore you're going to see again. But for those of you that have worked on this, what do you know about these bolts here, right? These bolts, you can be as gentle. You can put WD-40. You're trying to get them off. They snap. So there's kits out there. Like this is one kit that's out there. It's a guide. The drill bits suck. I'm not going to lie to you. They don't, they're not great drill bits. But the guide to actually drill and tap, there's kits out there to make your life. Yes, it's not cheap. I, I grant you're right. It's not cheap. But sure makes a lot easier because there's a 50-50 chance when I take, especially on the other side of this tube, that those bolts will snap and then you got yourself a broken bolt situation and now you got to tap it and drill it out you know so drill and tap it out so that's what you got to watch out so be aware of that but as i summarize and come across the egr always remember think about the sub cooling that takes place in the egr cooler i mean 200 degree coolant temperature right and then you got over 1300 degrees what is that temperature transfer that's taking place in the coolers so respect that that coolant is taking a big punishment. That's why that coolant must be maintained and observed, like we told you on the previous, you know, slides that I showed you this. All right, cool. Very good. We're almost up on the hour. We got half an hour to go. But again, what is reverse flow engine, right? That means we are flowing exhaust out of the middle of the valley. What are the concerns about these trucks? The high cost, but also, again, the maintenance and emission controls. We're going to get to that here in the after treatment. And what is a diagnostic trouble code? A test, right? And why is there a key on engine off, key on engine running? Because you're actually telling the computer to test those powertrain circuits. And which are the pins dedicated for CAN? Six and 14. What are the three connectors on the ECM? Body, engine, and transmission. There you go. And what are the thermostats at opening temperature for the secondary cooling? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Hopefully you know that one. So yeah, you got to know those thermostat that opening temperatures. So there, we covered that when it comes to that. And where's number one at? Passenger side. And which side is used for post-injection for regenerations? Driver side. What is the recommended oil for power stroke engines? 10W30 for normal use. And for severe dirty? Severe dirty, dirty. Duty, 5W40. That's what you're going to see. And what are the two sensors next to the oil filter we just saw? the oil pressure and oil te oil temperature. Hot or cold EGR? Oh, come on, we just said that one. Hot. And how many coolers, that's, oops, spell check problem there. How many coolers used? Dos, two of them. And is it changed in 2015? Yes, it went to a tubular style EGR cooler, which is updatable back to 2011, so. All right, moving on. We've got time here. We're going good, we're doing good. At this time, what can you do for the vehicle owner to lengthen the life of the 6.7? Service it. Oh, my God, service it. Here's the thing. What's a 6.7 use? 12, 13 quarts, right? You put that on an F650, 750. You know, that's not a whole heck of a lot of oil, especially if that truck just literally runs all day long, idles for long hours, runs hard, idles long hours, runs hard. You're beating the holy bejesus out of that oil, you know? So it isn't surprising. We see engines going 80 to 100,000 miles, and that's it. You know, what can we do to do that is to service it and change that oil, right? And then for the common oil injection system, 
you want to service that fuel filter? Yes, we do have CP4 pumps that are going over 300,000 miles, guys. Honestly, that's true. So therefore, the secret is to service. Why do you think I tell my customers, you may want to go to gasoline for what you're using it for? <clears throat> Why do I tell them that? Is because they're, you know, they're not working it hard enough, you know, so that's another thing. But also, you may want to evaluate the suit load. One thing that I've always said is, <clears throat> excuse me, is if the truck's coming in for service for an oil change, wouldn't it be a good idea to run a regeneration so you can burn all the suit? So when it leaves your shop after you do the oil change, it's not doing any active regenerations going down the road, and it should improve your fuel economy. Huh? Ever thought about that? Yes, sell that regeneration before that oil change, which is an hour of labor is what we usually charge. So, so if again, <laughs> excuse me, if significant part loader loaded, yeah, run a stationary regeneration if you have to, and also perform the cooling testing as we were talking about. Definitely want to do that. And ensure the death fluid that you're using is certified. So most most of you buy it prepackaged. <coughs> Those of you that are buying in bulk, <coughs> make sure you actually are careful about that. And more than ever, train the customer. Tell them, hey, this is death fluid. You know, I actually you know get my phone, and I actually go on YouTube and I pull up the ad blue. There's some animations that show how the death fluid is injected. <coughs> because when you're selling a death fluid injector or an after treatment parts. It's a hard sell because they don't understand what's in the exhaust. You know, they think there's just a muffler down there, if that. All right, let's get in the common room. Uh, common room, what can I tell you? High pressure side, low pressure side in return, right? Well, my first suggestion to you, if you want to make your life easy, you may want to purchase the caps. Those caps, they go where those injector lines go. And as you know, the high cost in diagnosing commoner is the fact that these injector lines are not reusable. They're not reusable at all. <clears throat> so with that said, caps can be your best friend. And what I mean by that is, for example, I got a truck that's come in and I'm doing a crank no start condition now. I can see on this scan tool I am not meeting the, you know, the rail pressure I need. Well, before I get started, I like always to remove the pressure control valve there on the back on the driver's side. So I like to get to this guy first. Why? Well, I want to know if the system's contaminated. And in this case, by easily removing, so yeah, I'll take the inner fender cover on the driver's side and I can get in there with my wrench. I'll loosen that puppy, take it off. And now I'll crank it over, have somebody crank it over for me with a tray there. And I'm going to see the what that fluid's like. No, you're not going to have high rail pressure, just be liquid just running out because you're not nothing you're pushing against. So in this case, I'm checking to see if that, you know, is contaminated. So if metal flakes or dirt or grime come out, it's kind of a red flag. Yeah, the system is contaminated. And if you've been working with common rail long enough, you probably know that. What is the number one enemy of common rail? Contamination. So yeah, contamination is the number one enemy. All right. Well, I got a new thing to add now. For those of you who have already seen this, guess what? I got an extra special now. Now it's happening about four or five times, twice in Vegas and twice with other uh, my other shops I deal with, is you get to the, you can't build no rail pressure. You probably get maybe 300 PSI. It's gotten to the point that you got to do this. Number one is I like to take the two lines off the injection pump. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the lift pump pressure still going to the injection pumps. You got to get created with the return system. But what I'm trying to do is with lip pump pressure coming towards the CP4 pump, I'm going to see if I spit out fuel out of that injection pump. So it's going to cost lines here, that diagnosis. Yes, I know. Why am I doing this? Because what we are finding now with the erosion going on with the nozzle, and it's getting worse. You might agree or disagree, but it, we were seeing a lot more. We have seen the erosion of the nozzle of these injectors. And what's happened is that we're now getting compression spit up through the injector itself so when i first saw it for the first time you know the tech, the mechanic i went to go work with he's literally cracking the line after doing a crank and you can literally hear a big pssst. in other words it would always have air in it and we wouldn't build pressure so now it's at the point where we need to do an air pressure check if we're still not building rail pressure now, what we finally did is to uh, you know, leave, find out where that compression was coming from. 
that pressurization of the common rail was to literally take all the lines off, crank the engine over. But here's the funny thing. One, as soon as we were cranking, you hear coming out from those in, from one injector. But on another one, we crank, 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 nothing. And all of a sudden, after two seconds after we were done with the crank session, all of a sudden, two injectors on either on opposing sides chucked out air. So in this case, yes, there is a breakdown internally in the injector. I understand that. But what I'm trying to tell you is that how many times have we diagnosed a common rail problem where we got no rail pressure, but we're trying to see which injector is the problem? Well, now that injector is pressurizing the whole fuel system on the high pressure side. So I'm like, okay, the thing is what a lot of guys, novice technicians have done, this is where it gets bitch in the butt real bad is you replace the injection pump because you won't build in rail pressure. You put the new pump on, but this pump is getting bombarded with compressed air from the cylinders because of a bad injector. What's going to happen to that injection pump? So I come into the scenario and I'm working on this and sure we find out pressurized air, but then after replacing the injectors, guess what? It still won't pressure up. Well, it turns out that, okay, let's take off these two lines and let's see if it actually spits anything out. And turns out we have CP4 failure again. And it wasn't because of there was a fault per se from drivability. It was because that compressed air or that, excuse me, that pressurized air from the compression actually hurt that new CP4 pump. So guess what? Got to replace the CP4 pump again. So I guess I'm getting to the point where if this truck sees a lot of idle time or runs continuously, you better start doing a compression check off the injectors. You're like, huh? Yeah, Tony made up tests now. Yes, and it does work. You need to make sure you got no compression coming up to those injectors in the event that you have low rail pressure. I never thought I'd be saying that. I know, I know. Don't give me a bunch of chat messages. Give me crap about that. But it's true. I'm telling you, it's happening. So those of you who have seen the erosion on the nozzles, you're going to know what I'm talking about. So let's get something clear, though. You do have a nice test using IDS to test the integrity of the fuel system if you have a drivability problem now. So if you have a drivability problem and you suspect you got low rail pressure, yeah, there is this beautiful high pressure system test, but it has a flaw in it. And what I mean by that is you're going to see that it does a ramp up test and I'm going to show a portion of it here. But what's going to happen is you're going to see the rail pressure commanded high and then you're going to see the measure pressure. So we're starting off at 4360. And by the way, look at the bottom left and you're going to see you see the PCV and the VCV duty cycle. So those guys are working together to control that rail pressure. Again, your VCV. Don't give me that bull crap. I hate it when guys talk about that, that, hey, guess what? You know, you're supposed to see you know, so much rail pressure, but understand that one works at idle, one works above idle, one works at 3,000 feet. I don't care. They both work together. So one will stop working momentarily, the other will start working momentarily. Yeah, but who cares? I need to know, do I have the rail pressure? You're not going to, look how fast that duty cycle is changing, guys. Really? All I need to know is it's changing. That's all I can see. But given the temperatures and load and everything it's under, that duty cycle is going to move a whole heck of a lot. So I don't know how you're using that to specifically know what a rail pressure shit is if not you're a genius better than me i gotta tell you that's to you but i'm over that let's look at the ramp up test so here we see 8700 rpm right and you see it jump up and in this case uh that works very well it's called a ramp up test that's what we like to call it if you ever worked on ram common six seven they used to have that ramp up test but never showed you a graph it goes rah, rah, rpm right there and that's what we're seeing there Ta -da! up to almost twenty nine thousand psi right well that's what we see there okay now, the problem with this is always remember, this is a no load test. And what I mean by that is the truck is not loaded. So this does not replace you to go on the test drive and put it on full load, you know, maybe power break it if necessary to see if you're not losing real pressure at that point, because that has been known to happen. Now, when you're done with this test, you're going to see that the RPM went bye bye. So let me backtrack this sucker just a little bit. And there, there you can see, hold on, there you can see the RPM, watch the RPM. You're going to see we're at 28,000, we're holding it at 28,000 PSI, and all of a sudden we go to zero RPM. The truck is stalled by the test. And what it's doing is a leak down to see if we're leaking. So therefore, it's going to give you the results if it leaked. So it's literally testing the integrity or the ceiling of the injectors, of the PCV valve, and also the VCV valve. So that's the nice thing about this test. There you go. All right.
So what about the CP4? The CP4, obviously we can use the VCV to be removed to inspect it. You can do that by all means. And I understand that you guys have seen the catastrophic where we found the metal and I told you how I do it. And as there are some kits are starting to adapt that's belt driven CP3s that I've now seen on power stroke six sevens. But always remember something. That CP3 is outperformed by the CP4. You see, the CP3 has three plungers. So that means for one given rotation, one, two, three, three plungers, right? Well, the CP4 actually has two plungers. You're like, eh, not, what are you talking about? Yeah, but it has two cams. So as that rotates once, that means we're stroking each one of those plungers twice. So technically it's four strokes. So when you go back to a CP3, you're actually kind of degrading the flow and the volume of it. So not to mention the CP3 was never designed to work at 29 PS, 29,000 PSI, like I showed you. It can do it, but it's not designed to do it all the time. So those heavy loaded trucks that run full load, full tilt boogie, you know, you're really going to see if that CP3 works or not. So let's get one thing clear. The CP4, its weaknesses, as it shows on the lower right, has been always lift pump pressure and volume. So therefore, air is a problem. Now, I don't have time to get into this big time, but just understand, do yourself a favor. If you're changing fuel filters, go ahead, prime the system up. You're done replacing the filters. Prime it up, get it going, right? At that point, once you fire it up, like an early bulletin that Ford put out back in 11, stated, let it run between 10 to 15 minutes. Hell, I go 15 minutes, so I'm done. I go wash my hands, I go work on something else. I'll let the truck idle because you want to make sure it works all the air out. There you go. And there's the cam right there. There you can see how there's two cams. So it strokes each per one revolution twice. You thought I was lying, huh? There you go. So on the high pressure side there, we I told you, you can take the pressure control valve off and you want to find out there's contamination, but do me a favor though. Once you put it back on, Make sure you torque this puppy up. Don't leave it loose because if you leave it loose, you're going to have a leak problem that's going to go into the return. So this line right here is going to return. Bear aware of that. So, so we talked about the PCV and the VCV and how they work with the CP4. There you can see my engine on a, this is a 2011 model. Here you can see the lines are crisscrossed. But once again, are the lines reusable? The answer is no, can't use them. But nothing substitutes, this is my favorite type, uh, favorite thing about IDS, is that you can actually do what? A power balance. So in this case, by you doing a power balance test, you're testing the integrity of each cylinder. But uh, hold on a second. You're seeing that I'm killing one cylinder at a time here. Obviously, if there was a miss, we would have a little valley form because of the miss. But please note, what about if you actually have mountains or peaks? That means that injector is overfueling especially with the nozzle starting to stick in the road, you got to look for that. So sometimes I'll let, I'll leave the graph running, I'll leave the engine idling, and at that point I'll make sure that I don't have any potential cylinder overpowering the other. So again, I'll have it like this, and as the engine's running, it should stay like this. But if I start to see peaks or valleys, but peaks especially, that means that injector is overfueling and overpowering the rest of the cylinders. So what I like about the power balance graph is that it leaves a signature. So I can literally see how all the cylinders were working here. So know how to use your power balance graph. So on the piezo common rail injector, what do we see? Well, we see that the top of the injector is an upper and lower piston, you're right? And the piezo stack works on a concept of expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. So that's what the electricals are doing. Yes, it does work with high voltage and high current, but it happens so fast. Unlike General Motors, where on the Duramax, they put orange wrap or accordion wrap on the LMLs. You know, Ford doesn't do it, but and because it happens so fast. But there's still a minute danger. So you don't you want to be careful when you wiggle those harnesses and you work with those harnesses. But common rail injection is not a common rail class, but common rails always worked on the concept of pressure differential. What I mean by that is, you know, you got this nozzle open, so we play with the pressure above and below it. And the guy that does this is that control valve that's controlled by those dual pistons. And by the way, when I see these pistons, it reminds me of a master cylinder where you got one big board or a small board, sort of like a primary secondary piston that we've seen. And in this case, that creates more force and travel to push down on this control valve, which is controlling your pressure above the nozzle. 
the volume and pressure is still the same going to the bottle nozzle, but once there's a pressure differential, the nozzle lifts, right? And that's what we see happening here. Now, when I looked at these pictures for the first time years ago, I said, man, especially this one right here, I'm like, this is a haven for trash. And what I mean by that is you get a lot of contamination that can cause, you know, these control valves to stick open. So that is a problem there. So now originally, when these trucks were first manufactured, you know, they come with the the IQA codes already put on the sticker on top. So they still do it, if I'm not mistaken. But in this case, just note that if the truck has had injectors, get a marker and cross these out so the next technician knows that these are not the current IQA codes on the injectors where they need to be programmed. And by the way, those of you who Spanish speaking, orale, look at that. Made in Mexico, Chihuahua, Chin Gators, man. Look at that. I'm proud of that. Yes, I'm half Mexican for those of you that don't know. So therefore, make it, mira que lindo. Look at that. Made in Mexico. We do something good, orale. There you go. Okay, I'm over that. Anyways, moving on. You like that, huh? But in this case, as we see the 6.7 evolve, we're going to see that the, uh, the uh, oil, uh, fuel filter has changed. You're now going to see three ports. So as we saw the early, please note that technically the 6.7 has two return systems. You see the return coming off to the PCV valve and the injection pump. So that's two returns right there. The outlet of the PCV and the outlet of the pump. But... The return off the injectors, believe it or not, goes to the inlet of the lip pump pressure coming in towards the secondary fuel filter. So in this case, that's always been that way. So therefore, that would mean that return pressure and lip pump pressure are the same. So there you go. But before I get more into that, please note that there have been updated changes to the fuel filters. And in this case, um, you saw the flat style with the different system, but what has also changed is the location of the lip pump. You see now the lip pump on the newer models are all in the tank, no longer in the frame. So on the early models, like this one, we actually saw the filter and the pump assembly all right here. And by the way, you see that big nut on the bottom, that's a 32, 34. I hope that most of you know there's a notch that has to line up up here. And I got a video on my YouTube channel that talks about that in this case where I see that happening. And a lot of trucks were the do-it-yourself or didn't know because you really got to put some muscle as you're tightening that canister to get that mark to line up. So be careful about that. So here you can see the drain valve of the straight style. And then you got the old traditional round style where they had the filter in there. So is it a messy affair? Yes, it can be messy. And here you could see the early style fuel filter. Now, I also have another video where I talk about this on my YouTube channel where you can get air in here. How many times have you guys have changed filters? And you prime it and you fire it up and you get a low rail pressure, low lip pump pressure indication on the dash. It'll turn on the check engine light. Sometimes you'll just pull this line off and it's going to burp a lot of air. And if not, you're going to connect a hose here to a canister or a container. And what you're gonna do is turn the key on and literally push that air that gets trapped here. Yes, air sometimes gets trapped here on the top of that filter. And that's what you're gonna see. And note from the Ford service information, this pump, when I see guys put aftermarket, you know, uh, fast or air dogs, whatever, I'm like, you gotta understand this pump is doing a good job. Look what it's capable of, 120 PSI. So it actually pushes to the 10 micron filter, but it's got a lot of punch in it. So like even the Ford service information here says is that it can actually supply three times the maximum amount of fuel. There you go. Now, as you know, lift pumps have been using an inertia switch, okay? Don't forget about the inertia switch. Those of you who don't know what inertia switch is, that's a switch that's designed to shut off the pump and in case of like a front end accident, it opens the contacts and it is resettable. And usually in the owner's manual will tell you where it's at, but it's usually on the passenger side, either on the side of the uh, glove box or underneath on the kick panel, depending on the year model we're talking about. But as we look at the overall newer systems, once again, where is the fuel pump located at? It's in the tank. So in this case, that would mean there's your flat style primary fuel filter, and then you can see your secondary fuel filter along with your return lines going back. No longer called an HFCM, it's now called a fuel diesel fuel conditioning module, which is DFCM. But what I'm trying to show you here is the lip pump is no longer again in the frame rail, in the housing of the filter itself. It is now located in the tank. Yes, I know what you're thinking. It sucks. You're right. But you better be careful. These units are now using a fuel pump control module. So in this case, that fuel pump control module, you can see from the wiring diagrams, 
as you can see over here let me, let me take this off for a second there you go here you can see the fuel pump power you can see the ground and in this case you'll notice that it is the fuel pump control module that's controlling the operation of the pump unlike gm this is still a traditional two-wire pump it is not a three-phase pump and there you could see the narrow frame that I mentioned and the wide frame I was mentioning, how they differ in wiring. Again, the cab chassis versus the super duty, right? And here you could see that the fuel pump relay is no longer serviceable. That means you got to replace this whole battery junction block right here if the event that relay should fail. But it not it does not power directly the pump. It goes straight to the fuel pump control module. So who's the order to come from? The power chain control module. So there's your fuel pump monitor to make sure it's getting voltage. That's your monitor FPM. And then you can see your fuel pump control circuit that's act telling the control module to turn on the pump. Watch out for that. The problems that I've seen already in the cap chassis has been the grounds. Right off of the pump, just follow the ground wire coming out of there. And in this case, make sure you know where that pump is ground. In other words, where the module's ground. Here you can see the ground right here. As a matter of fact, let me go back two slides here. That G. Um, the white frame is what I'm looking at. That G, excuse me, the narrow frame. That G403 is the one you're going to go after. It's on the frame rail. But if you were to be on the Ford Service Info, you can click on that. It'll tell you where it's located at on the frame rail, So, which I've repaired already. Also on the common rail systems, we have seen the fuel temperature sensor. We've seen the fuel pressure switch. That has been changed. Uh, the fuel pressure switch was actually monitoring for low lift pump pressure. So it'll turn on a message in the dash. So that has been now a two-in-one sensor that we see now. That's very new that we see now. So, But I mean, it doesn't make sense if you don't know the components. Four, what is four? The CP4 pump. Five is the VCV. Ten is your PCV. Nine is your driver's side rail. And two is your passenger side rail. One is your injector line. And what is seven? Your fuel rail pressure sensor, while six is your crossover line that feeds fuel rail pressure over to the passenger side. And those of you that don't know, all fuel outlet, high pressure coming out of the CP4 first goes to the driver's side rail, and then it goes over to the passenger side for those of you that pay attention. Now, <clears throat> Ford does not give us, Ford does not give us any recommendations on the actual fuel trimming. So in this case, you're gonna see here the fuel trim, oops, you're gonna see here the fuel trim <clears throat> that they're recom that you're showing on a live truck. So here I got a live truck. Let me hit play again here one more time. The magic number that I've learned to use is two milligrams. You're going to see that there's microgram changes. These are the normal changes in fuel volume that the computer is just, and he only tests is at idle at operating temperature. So in this case, we're looking at these and paying attention to. So I have made the assumption now. I'm I'm trying to get more clarity from people from Ford on it, but it's two milligrams. If you have anything different let me know and no i haven't been able to look at the q a because i'm moving along right now but <clears throat> note that you can still see so if i get a truck and i got over you know two milligrams that's a big red flag that you know something's definitely wrong there so remember milligrams is thousands of a gram micrograms is millions of a gram and that's what you're looking at all right as i'm approaching my timeline here and i still got to mention after treatment do you have a diagnostic plan if you haven't make one up you better be not using that scan tool first. You should actually be open hood and check the batteries, check connections, check for everything that's going on. Hell, does the truck have fuel? Is the air filter clean? You know. So obviously there are many possibilities, but many people say, hey, Tony, I don't even know where to start. Well, it starts with you having a diagnostic plan, you know. And that's part of our diagnostic strategy, which is what is the complaint? Verify, you know. How many times have I've had customers in the past, and yes, this is a true story a long time ago where the customer was complaining about light on dash and turns out it was the what what light do you see right there the seatbelt light not the check engine light. so yeah it's a good idea to verify you open the hood what's the condition of the batteries air filter and so so on you know what about an air filter you know that's all dirty obviously there's a safety items belt hoses and wiring and you want to eventually from the fourth to fifth step, you should be what at that point scanning it and run your key on engine off, can it running? Obviously, I don't know what the problem is. Is it a hard start? Is it a crank no start? Is it a drivability? No problems. So when we scan, you know, you actually will see that when I scan, I'm going to get a series of codes. So as I start a session, you know, I'm going to see a list and array of codes that can be set. Here I got a whole bunch of them, which is fuel rail pressure code. Here I got. You know, I got a whole bunch of stuff, and you're going to hear me say that this truck has no love, but I'll mute that. But look at all the list of codes I got here, right? So in this case, I see fuel rail pressure low. 
I see cylinder one contribution problem, cylinder six, right? And I'm going on and on, turbocharger and all that. And I'll give you the answer right now. You know what the problem was with this truck? Was A, a restricted diesel particulate filter, and B, it was caused because of a clogged air filter like you just saw in the previous picture. All those caused because mostly the cause was an air filter restricted. And believe it or not, this truck saw a code for restricted air filter. Again, that's why you got to have a diagnostic strategy because it'd be a sin that you try to run a regeneration without ever looking at the air filter first. I keep saying that over and over and over again. And again, if there's an issue with drivability, how has that affected the after treatment? And then again, it's an engine. What's the compression of the engine? You know, that's what you want to look out for. So as I move ahead, turbos, my biggest thing with turbos has been the fact that they're Garrett style and there's never been an indication of vein position. So in the early years, they had the cap chassis, which didn't have the wastegate and the pickup had the wastegate, but then they got rid of that in 2015. But I hate it when I see oil cooler, excuse me, oil leaks at the base of the turbo. And what that usually causes is that that technician didn't torque those bolts to specification and used a new gasket, you know, so that can be your issue too as well. But in 15 through 19, they updated the turbo. But my problem was, once again, is Ford was not monitoring the position of those veins. He guessed where the vein position is at, but we didn't know. So if you ever played around with a variable vein turbo, these variable veins have the habit of actually, you know, of uh, creating back pressure. And unlike General Motors, which used the same turbo back in the day with the LML, they actually were monitoring the veins and Ford never monitoring the veins. So when I see the injector nozzle issue, I see the issues going on with even valves, you know, a lot of it has to do with the excessive heat created by the back pressure. So with that said, please note that these turbos, again, uh, do create a lot of, uh, you know, a back pressure. So therefore, those veins, as you can see on the animation here, are actually, again, not monitor their position. So as they close right? They're creating excessive back pressure. So with that said, as I move along again, time is of essence. Always remember, smoke testing the intake is a good idea. So get a high pressure smoke tester because the new turbo for 2020 has made me very happy. Why? Because now with the use of an actuator, external actuator, we can see the veins open and closing. And at the same time, we see what? We see that he's now monitoring those vein positions. There you go. Keep that in mind. So obviously there have been uh, changes to the intake. You can see the early style versus the new style. There's a lot of cha different changes taking place now on the engine, right? But always remember that vacuum pump can leak oil and is designed to use with the early model wastegates and the EGR bypass. Lastly, real quickly, since my time is almost out, diesel oxidation, SCR, DPF. <clears throat> if you haven't taken after treatment, you need to take after treatment, you know, so maybe we'll be offering classes on that, but I do have them on my website as well. Um, but in this case, the DPF DOC, well, heat is the name of the game. As we look at this newer image that they have, heat is the name of the game with this. So we need to understand that it needs to be actively hot, but you need to know what you're looking at with these lights on the dash. So we know that active regeneration takes place where the injectors are literally you know, pumping fuel into the exhaust, right? So as you run a regeneration, you're gonna see those temperatures climb. So as I pull this one up, for example, you're gonna see that as you run a regeneration, let me play this here for a second. <laughs> and there's a series of things, but you can also get errors too as well. So those errors that can be about, you know, here we can see that the DPF regeneration was aborted. And it was because I had a problem with the scan tool at that time, but you'll notice there are many reasons why a you know a regeneration can be kicked out so therefore it is telling you in these inhibit messages why a regeneration wouldn't take place so you should know how a doc dpf and ser work you should know i'm sorry i'm not going to talk about it in this class because you should know if not take an after treatment course or take an online webinar course because the ser itself has a lot going on so the ser system for example needs to inject that death fluid into the exhaust, which readily converts to ammonia. And we have seen these guys leak, you know, that reductant tank, we've seen them leak. We see crusts of 
crystallized death there. So you're wondering why is it giving issues? Well, yeah, you need to inject the death fluid in there. So that's the job of the death fluid or dosing module injector. So that's injecting the death fluid. Again, it needs to be a hot exhaust in order to convert that death fluid to ammonia. And it is the ammonia that actually reduces the NOx emissions. So yes, we have this whole SCR subsystem. There's a whole class in itself. But understand that we have to have death fluid injection and we need to have adequate heat. <clears throat> the nice thing is, <clears throat> the nice thing, this is all on the top of the tank. And you can see the NOx sensors. Again, that's a whole class in itself. Note that there's a lot going on right there. So it all works together. As a matter of fact, the glow plug control module, in my opinion, should not be called a glow plug control module. It should be called a heater control module for the simple fact that <clears throat> it controls the heater for the tank and the lines and also the heater for the fluid itself along with the, the operation. So let me end it with this. <clears throat> Here you can see on this truck that I have a light on. Yes, that's a light on. Look at it right there. That is your NOx reducing light telling you there's ad inadequate NOx reduction. Now, what's happening is that the truck is going to derate to 50 miles an hour within how many miles? Let me go back again. Within 44 miles, it's going to derate to 50 miles an hour. This, there's no check engine light, mind you, but there's, it's going to derate. You're like, well, hold on a second. What's going on? Well, it's because this light or message is telling you that there's an adequate NOx reduction or B, he hasn't been able to verify NOx reduction. Get that clear. So obviously there's no diagnostic trouble code set because I got no check engine light, but it's threatening to derate me. So what did I simply do? Well, I know that a possibility could be that maybe it's not measuring the NOx reduction for the simple fact it hasn't gotten hot enough. Maybe this truck has a lot of idle time. So therefore we do the regeneration as you can see here. But what I'm trying to show here as I move along in the video is that I ran a regeneration, I got it all nice and hot. And believe it or not, even during the regeneration, it actually was monitoring NOx reduction between NOx sensor one and NOx sensor two. So what happened? I did the regeneration. And now, and you can see it was a hot day when I did this regeneration in Las Vegas, 111 degrees. But you'll notice that as I'm finishing up the regeneration, you can see this bar right here is almost done with the regeneration. What you're going to be able to see is that the message went away. So it's no longer threatening to derate the truck. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you got to understand what those messages mean on the dash, especially that I call it the sideways ice cream cone symbol right there, that one right there. So therefore, understand that, um, you know, that guy right there is telling you inadequate NOx reduction or I haven't been able to confirm NOx reduction. What do you think? Well, Mr. David, I am just about done here. Just about done, and your your voice is going so much talking. Uh, take take a quick yeah. break, Tony. I know. <laughs> uh, so take a double drink of water there, and yeah, hold on for a little bit. Um, we have a few <laughs> questions. If you wouldn't mind uh, trying to answer these questions, uh, the first one here states: Why do some super duties have the internal serviceable CCV filter, and others? you just toss the entire housing. These are big contributors to high crankcase PSI when clogged. Yes, you're right, Alex, you're right. Why do they make it that way? You're good as me. I, I, you would have to talk to somebody at Ford. I don't know. But in a way we can say that the fact that we can, you know, replace that internal serviceable filter, that makes it nice. But obviously we, in the past on the early model, you're right, I've thrown so many away, so. But in this case, always understand something. What clogged that filter too? That means you had excess, again, blow bite gases. And it goes back to that maintenance thing I was talking about. So change that all. Okay. Our next question says, I've seen a 6.7 smoke from the motor, smoke the motor from a leaking oil filter. It was finally ran dry. Should the engine shut down before it ran empty? And no. I guess it's no, okay. No, it does not have that oil pressure. You're right. That's It's primitive. That's what Ford's been doing. Never has an oil pressure switch ever been used to shut down the engine. So the answer is no. Yeah, you're right. That's that's pretty silly. All right. But no, it, that sensor does not have the input 
<laughs> I could say that till 21 model years. After that, I don't know. But it does not have the ability to shut down that engine. It'll set a diagnostic travel code, maybe, but no. You're right. You lose oil okay. pressure. All right. Thank you, Tony. Uh, another one here says, I need the AccuStrip strip number. Uh, email me at tsalas at dieseltg.com. T Salas, S A L A S, at diesel TG, which is training group.com. And I will email it to you because it'll take me forever to pull up the slide again because I don't have it memorized. But I'd be more than happy to email it to you, buddy. Okay. There's another one here. It says Have you seen pattern failures of the fuel pump relay in the BJB on Ford, similar to FCA and their TIPM? Well, first of all, the FCA is the volume control valve and their TPM is the tilting. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. So I've seen pattern with the fuel pump really? No, no, that has not been a, a, a huge problem. And like I told you, those models now equipped with the fuel pump control module, um, that is mostly a ground problem. But to say it's a high failure arm that I have seen, no, 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 so. Okay, thank there you. you. Um, another question here says, is the late model LS fuel pressure switch still a 25 PSI switch? You know, Matt, that switch was, no, no, no. That switch was, you're talking about the low pressure switch on the low pressure side. No, that one was rated for under, what is it? Under, uh, hold on. You know what? Now you got me curious on that one. Hold on a second. Let me, it's really close by here. Now my PowerPoint's locked up. No, it actually was rated to go above, 30, what was it? Uh, high between 35 PSI because we wanted to keep it in the 50s. So your question is asking, wait a minute. What's your question asking once again? Is, is, yeah, it's still the same calibration. Yeah, that is correct. It is the same calibration. I, I get the question. Sorry. Yes, it is still. It's just a, that they put those two sensors, which is the fuel temperature and the low pressure fuel switch, all in one. But it's still the same setting. Yeah. So to answer your question, yes, it's the same. But it wasn't 25, but it was a little bit higher thought. All right, go ahead, Mr. David. Okay, another one here in the uh, in the chat. Uh, what is it, the most common issue? to the cause of a return line blowing off an injector? High pressure, high pressure fuel. So you got an internal problem going on inside of one of the injectors. That's most likely the cause. Remember I was talking about the compression leakage where we can also get high fuel pressure leakage as well. So now you need to start looking at those injectors to see if they got excess pressure. That's why one thing I didn't get to cover in this class that I cover my other partial class that you need to buy that adapter. It makes your life easy. They sell it on Amazon, other vendors. It's the actual block off tool. You disconnect the return line, but you got to block the line so you can do a return off of that injector. So this blocks the line off so you can actually do the return off the injector. So the answer would be you need to do a return test on that injector. Okay, we have another one here, a fairly long uh, question. It says, got a 2012 F450 67 that we recently replaced a engine from Ford. We had replaced the CKP sensor and the tone wheel before installing engine, uh, BC OID engine. We had question marks on those parts. Got engine installed and engine attempts to start but never completely does. Have noticed sync message first goes, sorry, here, yeah, it's, it's, the text is really small. Okay, that must be all better. Um, to, 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 let's start again. It says, got a 2012 F450, 67, that we recently replaced an engine from Ford. We have replaced the CKP sensor and tone wheel before installing the engine because old engine, we had question marks on those parts. Got engine installed and engine attempts to start, but never completely does. Have noticed sync message first goes yes, then no, and then back and forth, mostly no. Install new compressor, no, sorry, install new cam sensor and have attempted to monitor signals with scope to watch for the signals. No real good, no real good on scope usage, but thinking there could be an improper timing mechanically. Need to have someone review a snapshot. Any other input? Good. Actually, one of the guys actually put a, a complete story on the scoping of that on our diesel TG forum. 
okay. you may want to reference that, but given the fact that you're not syncing is telling me we've got a crank cam problem. So my question to you, and you may not like this answer is, when you put that tone wheel on, that whole little hubby thing that for the tone wheel for the crank sensor, did you use an air gun? Because hopefully you did not distort it or hurt it. So you may want to start off by scoping. So you need to scope. So um, you got to definitely know what the scope is. If you want some samples, we do have, uh, I think it was Matt that put it up there, um, that actually shows a, a crank and cam signal. So usually when I've seen this kind of situation, sir, it has been the fact that somebody did not install that tone wheel correctly, that tone wheel correctly, that little hub magnet thing, which is your reluctor wheel. So I would do that. But tell you what, I'll make it better because time is of essence here. Give me also an email at tsalas at diesel tg and I'll further discuss it with you on that. So don't salas at diesel tg.com and I'll further discuss that with you. But yeah, I, I'd be looking at that tone wheel going on there. And yes, is not good. We got to verify what's going on there. So okay. But I'll further go with that. I think Tony, that's about all we have time for uh, at the present time or today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating here in this uh, webinar, and especially Tony for uh, giving us such great information. That was a, uh, a wonderful webinar, so much uh, information, uh, and we really, really appreciate that. Um, I recommend uh, all of you look at our Facebook page uh, and, and the rest of our social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, for information on future webinars. We're going to have another one in November another one in December, and then we're um, talking to Tony as well for more uh, webinars next year. So if anyone has any suggestions, recommendations, what you'd like to hear or see uh, in future webinars, please let us know and uh, we'll try and take that into consideration. In addition, uh, we'll be at uh, Apex in a couple of weeks time. Um, we'll also be at HDAW in January. If you're going to these shows, please uh, look us up. We have a booth at each one of these uh, trade shows and uh, we look forward to seeing you. And with that, we'd like to wind things up. Thank you once again for your attention and for participating and uh, we'll see you again in November. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Goodbye.